Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, we are still under our strike uh, day. And I think this is the last day, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully tomorrow you'll see get to see this uh, up on INL. Right now we're sharing it on our Patreon channel. And, you know, no matter what happens in life, always something good will come out of it. And recently, with some friends, we were talking about the story of Adam and Eve and the fall in the garden. More specifically, we got into the subject about the, the, the basically the punishments, we'll say, that God put out is what most people call that. Uh, you know, some people will call it the curses. Some call it, you know, uh, just whatever. Um, and... I didn't have with me a Hebrew Bible to where I could sit down and kind of help break that down a little bit. But as a result, I, me and my wife continue to talk about the subject later. And uh, as we did, I reminded her some things, you know, that, that, that I knew about on that. Uh, she ran across a, a very good video, actually, where someone was doing a video about um, what the Hebrew verbiage was used in there in Hebrew and how what what these things actually really meant and uh, and it was pretty all going close the guy that was doing it so I began I, I came back here to the office and I began to look look it up again and I was I was looking up the scriptures on uh, Genesis uh, it of course it brought back the memories when I taught this years ago uh, that you know the things that God says to, to both Adam and Eve and even the serpent uh, they're very prophetic, and uh, it's not exactly what a lot of people think. And granted, anytime you're studying Scripture, you have to remember the English language, whether we have King James, New King James, NIV, whatever you choose to use for an English translation, is only translating to whatever scholastic view that they may have on the subject. Uh, so, different opinions out there about what words mean, how they should be translated. Uh, and then you have the situation even with the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Bible that was not finished until nearly a thousand years after Christ. And the rabbis put all of these vowel points in there, uh, claiming it's to be able to help you to pronounce the words. It's very, very different from... We'll say that, and, and I'll show you, and, and this is, of course, not an original, but I'll just kind of give you an idea. Um, when you're looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in particular, you know, if we look at the book of Genesis and the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you know, there are no vowel points. And uh, so that's also another uh, big difference there. Uh, I'm trying to get enough windows down here, maybe where I could make this actually... Uh, come up a little bit faster. Got too many windows going on here in the background. But um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's it, they don't use vowel points. Vowel points were never used. And so therefore, if you put vowel points in there, you can change the entire meaning just with the vowel points. And the vowel points be completely wrong. That's another big problem. And in fact, uh, one way that I actually show that, and I'll take you real quick to this, is in the book of Numbers. Uh, this is one particular case where the vowel points are used, and they're completely incorrect. Um, I know this, and I've shared it with you, because even Moses spells the word differently, and it's the word Nephilim. Uh, we have the Dagish vowel right here, but we have the Yod in there, whereas over here you have no Yod. There's no Yod between the Fe and the Lamed. <clears throat> this is the Fe and the Lamed right there. See, there's no, no letter in between there. The Fe and the Lamed here, you have a letter in between. You can see that little Yod right there. It's like a little apostrophe is what it looks like. That actually, that yod tells me that the word is nephilim with an e sound, like the vowel point would indicate. Over here, the rabbis put a dagish under the fe, the letter fe, right there to the right, indicating that the letter yod should be there, but it's not. And so they're telling you to pronounce it nephilim, like they do in English here. 
But in reality, it would be incorrect to pronounce it that way. It would be Nephilim. It would actually have a kamatz underneath it, which would look like the letter T, uh, much like what we have under this gimel right here, that little letter looking like a T, capital T. That's what should be up underneath of there if you're going to put vowel points in there. Obviously, Moses spelt it, the two words differently. So it's obvious that there was a reason why he did that. Um, well, when you're studying the Hebrew language, there's a lot of things like that. I bring that up because we're going to have another similar case here in Genesis chapter 3. And although we're not going to go into the issue of the fall itself per se, I want to get into the issue of childbirthing. Because the question comes up, do women suffer childbirth in pain as a result of the curse of Eve in the Garden of Eden? That's a legitimate question. Women do suffer a lot of pain in childbirth, but not every woman that has a child suffers pain. In fact, my father-in-law, his sister, had, I think, three children, and I remember her telling me it was the easiest thing she ever did. I was blown away by that statement. I said, easy? She said, yes. She said, I never, she said, you know, people talk about having birthing kids and they have all this pain. She said, I was in labor like an hour and boom, the child was out. And uh, she said, and all three of my children, she said, the next two were e much easier than the first. She said, but even the first was nearly without any pain. She said, like a little bit of gas pain. And that was it. And it was over. Well, of course, they have the epidurals today, too, where it's, you know, it's just more pressure, less pain. But, and then there's techniques that could be practiced and things of that nature that also help to make it much easier. But there's still this stigma that women have to give birth in pain because of the fall. Hmm. Well, I want to take you through that because as that subject came up this past weekend, and as me and my wife have continued to discuss this, and as I said to her, it's prophetic what God says to uh, Eve and uh, even to Adam. But I also <clears throat> made a great discovery when I was reading Adam. Uh, but we're going to go into the woman first because I'm really hoping that this is going to bless someone out there that's listening that no doubt we're probably going to get a comment in the comment section saying, Brother, I needed that, right? Because uh, this is a very fascinating subject. Let's start with verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, uh, well, you know what? Let me, let me let's just back up for a moment. Uh, you know, maybe it's not really fair to start there. Let's go ahead and look at the whole fall to some degree. And the Lord God called in the man and said unto him, Where are you? You know, we know the whole, we, well, let's, let's go like this here. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. You know, we know the whole story in Genesis chapter 3. This is where the serpent is going to entice the woman in order to get her to sin and to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this is the way it all starts off. Uh, the woman tries to deal with the serpent. You know, they're able to eat of any of the trees that they want, but the tree of that's in the midst of the garden, uh, the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they're not to touch it or look at it or anything. The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Okay, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Yedea tov vera'ah. Hmm. And the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves girdles. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden toward the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto the man and said unto him, Where are you? I highlighted that where are you intentionally. I hope you think about that one. That's something to really think about. 
where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should, should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now, the word right there for beguiled also is deceived. Some people use the word seduced, but it's actually deceived. He deceived her. Now, I, I want to share something with you, though, as I, as I bring these things out here. Um, I had up here just a moment ago. Let me figure out where I put that at again. Here it is right there. This picture to start off with showing Eve reaching up to an apple tree, the serpent entwined upon the tree. A couple of things I'll just mention, and this is not anything we're going to weigh on on this very much, but just something to think about. You have to remember God cursed the serpent to go on his belly. So he couldn't have technically been on his belly to start with, you know. Now, the question comes up sometimes, too, did they really eat from a tree? Well, I do believe that she did. And the reason why I say that, I want to remind you of Luke's gospel, for example. Uh, when we have, or wait a minute, that's actually not the one thing. It's John, uh, John. in the gospel of John. We read here in chapter 6, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? This Jesus said, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat my flesh, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I mean, think about it. I mean, it sounds almost cannibalistic. Not just almost, it just flat out sounds cannibalistic in what Jesus says there. He goes on to say, For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now, Jesus never explained it to the Pharisees, but it was a type. Just like Adam and Eve, they did, you know, we read in there, they partook of the tree. And yes, they did. There was some act of a physical eating of some type of a fruit from some type of, from the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. We know this. Why? Because in symbology, Jesus tells them to eat his flesh, drink his blood, or they wouldn't have any life in them. But in reality, at the communion, when they broke the bread and he passed it around, he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat this and do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup. He gave thanks to God. He drank from it and he passed it around the wine. And he said, drink from this cup as often as you do this. You do this to show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. I mean, I have it exactly right. But the point is, when he spoke to the crowds, he was a little bit more blunt and looked very cannibalistic the way he put it. But it was a, it still was in symbology. Because he didn't actually require them to physically eat his flesh or drink his blood. But in a spiritual sense, he was the tree of life. They would have to consume him in order for him to dwell within them. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Again, though, it's not a physical eating the way we would think. That's very much what we were looking at over in Genesis. But do I believe that there was some kind of fruit that they partook of? Yes. Do I believe it has a deeper meaning on top of that? Without a doubt. 
but I do believe you had both. Let's continue on, though. And the Lord said, verse 13, And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. That's why we know it's the word deceived. He talked her into doing that. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you from among the ca- from all cattle, from among all beasts of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Now I'm still going to come back and figure that one out by God's grace. Because he is cursed to go on his belly, so I know he wasn't on his belly. He is cursed from being over all the cattle. That was authority. He was given a, because I know this from earlier readings in the Hebrew Bible, that he was an authority over everything. I think there was a bit of jealousy, if you ask me, of the serpent and the man. Then we get into the next part. This is where it gets very, very, very interesting. God goes on and he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And I'm going to have to read some Hebrew here for you because I really want you to understand this. Ve'eva ashit benecha uven ha'isha. Okay? This is right here. This is where I want you to start noticing here. Ubenecha, that is Bain, Bet Yod Nun, but then you have the Cha, the, the, the letter Chet right there. That is, so he says, when, I, when he says, I'm going to put enmity, or the word is hatred, between you, that's a singular you. We read it in, they have it over there, the, okay? But we know that means you. Between you and the woman. And not just and the woman, but and between uvein haisha. I'm putting a hatred between you and between the woman. Haisha. Now, the fact that there is the letter he in front of isha lets us know Eve is the only woman that this hatred is going to be between him and between her. And we could even argue the word vain right here is like divinity. There is a hatred, but it's of divine origin. His hatred between her and him. Uvain, and then he goes on to say, Uvain, and between Zeracha, in the blue, that's the seed, and between the seed, but not just any seed. Look at the green right there. That's another head. That's a singular you between your seed. Uvain, and between. Zerah. That's her seed. And again, it's singular. Now, interestingly enough, I mentioned to you, I, had, I pulled open the Hebrew text over here. Let me just see if I can pull something up for you real quick. Because if you were to have Tovia Singer, he would be telling you, there's no such thing as seeds of plural in Hebrew. Yes, there is. Yes, there is, Tovia. Um, wow. I don't know if I'll be able to find it quick enough doing this or not. Let me just see here. Uh, I, I've done this so many times in the past for you guys. And I know many of you already know this. Keep the commandments in the seat of the wicked ones. Boy, I need to come back and look at some of these myself. Anyway, in the Hebrew language, we do have the word seeds, and it is in the plural. And I don't think they do it in English that way. No, they don't. Uh, but they do. it is done in Hebrew. Zarim is what it 
shows in there. Uh, so yes, it is plural. Uh, but what I was wanting to show earlier, though, that I did not show you guys, there's your Hebrew without vowel points. Okay, this is the way it is in Hebrew there. So anyway, well, let me go back to where we're at, though. Okay, so in between her, your, your seed, singular, and her seed, singular. Okay. Hu yashifcha. All right. Now, they put in here, or whoever wrote this, they, it was, they translated this as, whoop, hang on one second, guys. They put they, I put it in blue on the right, verse 15, they shall bruise your head, they, all right? In Hebrew over here, and I've, I've spoke about this many times before, but in verse 15 over here, we do not have the word they. It is he. Who is how you pronounce it in Hebrew. The letter, uh, the three letters, hey, vav, aleph. Who, yeshufecha, he. And who's the he? The woman's seed. The antecedent is the woman's seed. He shall bruise, rosh, your head. I'm pointing to the computer. I know you guys can't see it. I apologize. He is in the dark blue right there, okay? All right, and then the next word, Yeshufecha, he shall bruise or wound, and to the singular, talking about the serpent there, he shall bruise your head. Now, this may bring up an interesting question. And in a way, that's why I say this is so prophetic and so profound, right? He shall bruise or wound your head. And the he is the woman's seed. So the question is, is it the serpent's head or the seed of the serpent's head? Aha. Uh -huh. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Yeah, right? Very much. So... Uh, I kind of think it's the seed of the serpent, but it is going in the singular, though. And therefore, we read about the scripture about, maybe that is a scriptural thing. Let me pull this up. Um, I'm going to pull something up here for you. Second, I'm almost positive. Oh, goodness. We know that Jesus is referred to as the second Adam, right? And I, for some reason, I, I think, yeah, there we go. All right. Um, hmm. Yeah, here we go. First Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. There it is right there. Keep that one in mind. All right, we're going to come back to this. All right. And by the way, when I mentioned earlier that that word was not de dealing with the word seduced, but rather... Um, yeah, here we go, right here. Hishani, Hishani, the root of that is the letter Shin Yod Aleph. All right. It is the word deceived. I, I happened to see it when I was clicking over there looking for this particular issue on Adam. Uh, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Okay. So that's another reason why you know it's deceived and not seduced. Just a little thought, just a little side note for you there. All right, coming back. I don't want to. I don't want to lose you guys. This is so beautiful, and I'm trying to go slow, uh, so we don't miss anything here. All right. So anyway, so we know that he bruises. Who's the he? The he is definitely the seed of the woman. He bruises the serpent's head. Veata tushufuneo a cave, a cave, okay? And you, now they put on there, 
and you shall bruise their heel. Now, they put the word there. Now, the way the vowel points are, I have it. Here's the teshufaneu. And I pronounce it according to the vowel point right there. That does appear to be bruise there. But again, I said to you, like we had in the book of Numbers, I showed you a minute ago here. They put the fe and the lamed here. They put a vowel point underneath it, right up under that letter fe, that little dot, implying that there should be a yod there. And over here, the yod is there, okay, between the fe and the lamed, and the yod is that letter right there, but the little dot under the fe, which gives it the haneflim. But over here, it doesn't have the yod. So therefore, we know clearly that it's nephalim. It is, see, the difference is, is that Enoch, see, it says, B'nai Enoch, the sons of Enoch, but Enoch was from what? He was from the fallen angels. Min nephalim. That's why those vowel points are very important when they're incorrect. And so I believe the same thing we have here, Tushifaneu, should be Tushifaneo, which would be his heel. And you shall bruise his heel. Okay? Uh, the reason being, I say that, you have to understand, there's another important reason behind that. In Hebrew, if you have a plural, when you have a plural, uh, in the case whether it be a noun, pronoun, or whatever, and then you have the verb, the adjective, etc., or, or whichever the case may be. They have to be. They have to uh, agree. Okay, a keva is a heel singular. So if it was actually their heel, then it would have to be a kavim, and we don't have a kavim there. So therefore, we know it's a singular. So therefore, this bruising all should 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 be a singular. All right. Now we get into the next part. That was just, that kind of gets you a little educated in where we're going with this. Now we're going to break some really big stuff down now. Because now we're going to get into the woman, he, and into the woman he said. Now the first thing we have in the purple, El Haisha Omer. To the woman says. All right. Now in English they put, let me, let me quickly just do a King James also. Because uh, I want to make sure those of you that follow along in King James that that we're also following along with the same thought process here. So I want to just make sure of that. Um, let's go down here. And into the woman he said, yeah, there it is there. See, and to the woman he said, look what you have. I will. I will. All right. In the Hebrew language, we do not have the word I will. I have haraba arbe in the black right there. But there's nothing in between the omed and haraba arbe. Nothing between there. Now they, Then they have greatly multiply. And that's what they would consider to be in the black. All right. So let me just highlight that. And... And I got it in yellow, but I have it in black in the Hebrew. Uh, they got on there will greatly multiply. You could translate it that way if you desire. But there's something that doesn't quite line up. Especially when you begin to take it in context of what's being said. So he, says, he said unto the woman... This is if God is saying it. I will greatly multiply your pain... And your travail. And in pain you shall bring forth children. If you remember I said to you. This is all prophetic. For one. Alright. And some people are worried that. You know does this apply to women. Down through time. If it's giving pain and childbirth. Well first off. It's not that she's having physical pain birthing children. And it doesn't even say that, as it says here, you shall bring forth children. Right? That's what you have in English. You shall bring forth children. In Genesis and King James also. Yeah, you shall bring forth children. But in Hebrew, it doesn't even say that. It says right here, Teladai Banim. 
you will birth sons. Hmm, a little different, isn't it? Doesn't say Teladai Yaladim. Yaladim would be children. Teladai Yaladim. It doesn't say that. And by the way, remember I said they have to be in unison and rhyme? Teladai is the plural for the birth or to bring forth children. But in this case here, Benim is sons. More than one son. Bene is a son. Doesn't say Telid. Doesn't say Telid Bene Ve'al Ishach. But it says Teladai Benim El Ishach. Okay. Well, that's a different sentence anyway. Sorry about that. Let me, let me back up for you now. Let's go back to the, before we get into the sons, we need to go back over here and we're going to look at some other words and we're going to come back up to the Haraba Arabe. Uh, I'm going to still address that. I want to look at the next part, thy pain and thy travail and in pain you shall bring forth the children, right? That's what it says there. The important aspect for you to understand is you see these little green things here? I'm highlighting them in blue, just one by one right there. There's two of them there. That is the word you, singular, in Hebrew. So when I'm reading this in Hebrew, when I'm looking at this pain and sorrow, I know specifically it's to Eve alone. If it was not to Eve alone, it would have... This letter here, the Chet, and followed by this letter right here, the Mem, down there in verse 17. Okay? The Chet and the Mem. That would be pronounced Chem. So we would go right here after it says Haraba Arbe, it's Bone Chem. But in this case, it says it's Bone Cha. So it tells me that this is being specifically spoken about to her and that she is going to suffer with pain and actually the right word is sorrow. That's what's going to happen to her. She's going to deal with pain and with sorrow. And that pain and sorrow is going to be as a result of the birthing of sons. Okay? I want to show you, though, how you know this to give you some examples. Okay? I think here, let me see if I have it over here. Here we go, right here. Here's one right here. This is in um, Proverbs chapter 15. The root of the very word there that we deal with is etzav. All right? Notice that. Ein, sadi, vav. If you go back to Genesis, here it is right here. Ve'etzav. Okay? You're going to, uh, thy, thy pain and your travail and pain. See, they keep using that word pain. But that etzav is literally, it's in sorrow. The, the letter bet in front means in, in sorrow. You're going to bring forth in pain and in sorrow sons. Hold the thought. We're still not done yet. Okay, hold the thought. You're going to bring forth sons in pain and in sorrow. According to Proverbs, that word right there, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by a sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Ubetzavta lev. Ruach nekeah. By sorrow of heart. Not only does it use the word sorrow here in the book of Proverbs, but it also tells you it's a sorrow of heart. This is what Eve is going to suffer. See, God knew that she was not only did, did she make the mistake and listen to the serpent, 
but she was going to conceive and have sons and that was going to cause her a great pain and a sorrow. Why? God knew that Cain was going to kill Abel. And for a mother, they're both her children. One is causing her pain that Cain would be willing to murder his own brother. And of course, the death of Abel caused her that great sorrow. And so God knew that. Now, the interesting thing is, though, let's see, I can never get rid of this unless I do like that, all right? Is what I have in black, where they put greatly multiply. Haraba arbe. Okay, now I'm going to put it in blue for you, dark blue, so you can see it. The word Raba is great, that is true, but when you have the definite article hey in front of it, it's like the great one. The great one, and then Arabe doesn't have to be the word multiply either. It can be lying in wait. Like a lion that crouches waiting to, to strike, to attack. Haraba Arabe, the great one lying in wait, if you translate it in that way, which is perfectly right to do, will cause you great pain and sorrow, and you will birth sons. Haraba Arabe. Can you prove it, Brother Steve? Sure, I can. Go to Psalms chapter 10. There it is right there. Twice it uses the word Arav. The very word that you just read in Genesis. Ya Arav bemiseter ka'aria besechahu ve'arav lachatuf ani. He lieth in wait in secret place as a lion. As a lair, he lieth in wait to catch the poor. That's exactly what the devil was doing. We want two as a witness. Let's go to Proverbs, the same thing. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Narba l'adom. Again, our the three letters right there, that's the root of your word right there. Lying in wait. And that's what the serpent was doing. He is called the Great One. Haraba Arabe. The Great One was lying in wait. Causing you pain and great sorrow. And you'll bring forth sons. Now we begin to see the truth of the verse. Then we go on. Ve'el ishcha. And to your husband. To shutecha. Ve'hu imashal becha. Again, notice all these chets in here. Everything. There's one right there. Your husband. Okay, tu shutecha, again, you again singular, speaking of her, and that word there is, uh, and let's see, they put on there, and your, and your desire shall be to your husband. It's, it's not, desire is not even a good word to call the word shuk. Shuk in this case here, it is a longing. To your husband, you will have a longing. And he will dominate you. What is that longing that she has? The longing is that it would be like it was before the fall. But now that they're in a fallen state, sin has come in. It's no longer that peace and harmony. And no doubt Adam still loved her. But that she had that longing for things to return back to the way they were. 
Then we read on. This is where it gets really beautiful. Now, so we established the fact here. One, it's only between her and the serpent. There's going to be a hatred between the two as a result. There's going to be a hatred between her seed and his seed. And her seed is going to bruise his head. And he's going to bruise the heel of Christ. And she's going to have sorrow and pain as a result of that great one who was lying in wait to attack her. And she would birth sons. That's why she would have the sorrow and pain, the sorrow of heart, not of a physical, fleshly pain of giving birth to sons. But we read on down, and unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you should not eat, not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. And toil shall you eat of it all the days of your life. See, if they had eaten from the tree of life, which was Christ, they would have no need to be toiling. Here's where it gets more prophetic again. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. The thorns would be the very thing that Jesus would be crowned with later. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return into the ground, for out of it were you taken. For dust you are, and dust you shall return. This is where we, this is the part of the second Adam right there. As we just read over here a moment ago, and what was it, Corinthians, I believe it was. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was a quickening soul spirit howbeit that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual the first man is of the earth and the earth and earthly the second man is the lord from heaven and then we read in genesis In the sweat of thy face shall you eat bread. And Jesus Christ literally fulfilled that portion of Scripture. As we read in the the Gospel of Luke saying, Father, if you will be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly in his sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It didn't say that it was drops of blood, but like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The sweat of his brow. And the thing is, it says, and you know, in order for him to eat the bread, that's what would have to happen. And this is also the very place, um, let's see, With, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I send you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The whole communion, the bread itself, but what it would take to bring forth for him to have that Passover meal would truly be by the sweat of the brow. And he sweated like it were great drops of blood. Everything in Genesis is prophetic. Everything speaks of Christ. Even down to the part of what the woman would suffer. And if I got into this and really teach to you redemption from all of this, it will blow you away. Redemption is so deep, so powerful, and so rich, and so amazing. I really pray this has blessed your heart in some way. Thank you for listening. You can visit our website if God lays upon your heart. And I'm sure there will be those that he'll lay it upon their heart to support the work we do. Please do. 
We are loading some of those videos that we took down from YouTube over on iConnectFX.com. You can also find those in the latest videos here on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And if God does place it upon your heart, you can donate just by clicking here online. It'll take you to the donate page there or by mail to Noon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. God bless you. We do need your help, and we thank you that God puts that in your heart to want to help us along the way here. Um, anyway, so uh, let's see. I think that wraps it up for tonight. Uh, oh, also, too, if if you catch us over on iConnectFX, let me just let me remind you of something on that issue there. Oh, LifeWave. That, that is an amazing product. We are still experimenting with that, and and really hearing a lot of great testimonies as well. So um, anyway, God bless you. Thank you for listening. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live.